is from Psalm 22. If you're able, please stand. Hear these words from Psalm 22, and we'll respond by singing. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall, shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Amen. Let's respond together in song. We'll go to number 36. We'll sing all four verses. After the song, we'll remain standing and uh, we'll read together the questions and answers on page 14 in the back from Lord's Day 7. But for now, let's respond together singing number 36, all four verses, the ends of all the earth shall hear. of God, congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. Receive his greeting this morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of his Holy Spirit. Amen. If you would go to the back of our blue hymnal, page 14 in Lord's Day 7. We remind ourselves of how this God gives us clean hands and pure hearts. We use uh, the questions and answers of this Lord's Day, Lord's Day 7, to lead us into saying the words of the Apostles' Creed. 
and remind ourselves that not all men are welcomed unto this God, but we must come to him through Christ our Lord. So we'll begin at question 20. We'll respond with the answers together with one voice. Are all men saved through Christ, just as all were lost through Adam? No, only those are saved who by true faith are grafted into Christ and accept all his blessings. What is true faith? True faith is not only a knowledge and conviction that everything God reveals in his word is true, it is also a deep-rooted assurance created in me by the Holy Spirit through the gospel that, out of sheer grace, earned for us by Christ, not only others, but I too have had my sins forgiven, have been made forever right with God, and have been granted salvation. What then must a Christian believe? Everything God promises us in the gospel. That gospel is summarized for us in the articles of our Christian faith, a creed beyond doubt and confessed throughout the world. And what are these articles? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, I believe a holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We'll move into a time of a confession and assurance. Uh, one thing that I'd like us to consider today and uh, hopefully learn is the difference between admitting sin and confessing sin. One author uh, puts it this way, to admit implies that you know what you did or felt was not right. Maybe even you know that the Bible calls certain things, feelings or deeds, sinful. But you also know that the beating heart of this sin lives too deep inside you to disengage. Perhaps you believe this is just you, how you are hardwired, or perhaps you have been crafting this sin for decades. The question is, as a believer, is sin part of who I am? Is that just how I am hardwired to be? Or, in other words, from whose point of view should we interpret our sin? The world around us, the culture around us believes uh, resoundingly that life is to be interpreted from the point of view of how I feel. How do I perceive things? How do things feel to me? And that explains why we have become, often as a Christian culture, one that admits sin rather than confesses it. For we do not linger long enough at the cross to know the difference. Think last week about the difference between the Pharisee and the tax collector. The tax collector was not just admitting his sin. He was owning it. He was confessing his sin. To admit your sin means that you become a defense attorney for it. You say, I, I admit that this is something that I do, but here's the reason why I do it. To confess sin is to lay it all before a holy God. Do not try to make excuses to come before him with a broken and contrite heart. And that is what God wants. He wants our confession of sin. He wants us to bring it before him and to lay it bare. So let us hear the words of Psalm 51. That will uh, be uh, the, our prayer of confession today. Words from Psalm 51, which exemplify for us really the idea of confession and confessing our sins. We'll linger over these words a bit. And as we have pause uh, in your heart and in your mind, um, Come before the Lord with a broken and contrite heart. 
and confess your sin. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, have mercy upon us according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercies, blot out our transgressions. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. For we know our sins and our transgressions are ever before us. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within us. Cast us not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation and uphold us with a willing spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear this assurance of grace and forgiveness in our great and wonderful God. Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. How does God forgive our sins and our transgressions? He forgives them through the life and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God who came to earth, who took on humanity, and who is our only mediator and savior and our redeemer. As you come before God in repentance, look in faith to Jesus Christ. And if you do that, there is forgiveness and salvation. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I'd like also to read the law, the law of God, as a, a, a call on, upon our lives to live our lives in gratitude to God. God has created us. God is the one who is able to tell us what is right and what is wrong. So here then, uh, the law of God, we will read the Ten Commandments, and then uh, I will expand by giving further scriptures uh, that illumine these commandments for us. So, the God who saved us in Jesus Christ has given us this law, saying, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Thus we will worship the Lord our God and serve him only. You shall not make for yourself an image of anything to worship it. Thus living no more in bondage to earthly gods, we will worship the Lord our God in spirit and in truth. God says, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Thus we will use the holy name of God with reverence, praising him in everything we do and say. God says, you shall observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, for in six days you shall labor and do all your work. For this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the first part of the law, which in summary is found in the great commandment, that you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength. The second part of the law is similar to the first. You shall honor your father and mother, that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving to you. Thus, as children, we will be obedient to our parents in the Lord. As parents, we will correct our children and guide them in the training and instruction of the Lord. We will respect the lawful authorities appointed by God. And God says, you shall not murder. We will be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave us. God says, you shall not commit adultery. Thus, we will use our bodies in ways that are holy and honorable and abstain from immorality and impurity. God says you shall not steal. Thus we will do what we can for our neighbor's good and work faithfully so that we may share with the poor. And God says you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Thus we will speak the truth with our neighbor in love, render judgments that are true and make for peace, and not devise in our hearts any evil against anyone. 
And God says, you shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Thus, we will be content, whatever the circumstances, through the strength of Christ that is within us. So we must love our neighbor as ourselves. For the Lord requires of us to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Amen. Amen. We give thanks for the Lord's gospel. We give thanks for the renewal of life that he gives to us in the strength of Christ and by the power of the Spirit. Let's remain seated and we'll go to number 261 in our red hymnal. We'll sing of the wondrous love of God that has redeemed us. Remain seated, sing all three verses of what wondrous love is this. 261 in our red hymnal. Let us sing a song of praise before our sermon this morning. Let's go to page five in our song packet, and we'll sing Complete in Thee. Complete in Thee. This is number five in our song packet. Stand together, and uh, we will sing verses one, three, and four. One, three, and four of Complete in Thee. One, three, and four. Let's stand together.
Let's go in God's word to Luke 18. I began this week uh, planning on preaching verses 15 through 27, and then I really started to see the, the ways in which this passage is uh, unified, really in, in a close and important way, from 15 all the way through verse 43. So then I decided to preach that whole passage, 15 to 43, and then as it all began to come together, I saw that I bit off more than I could chew in one sermon, figured you all wanted to eat not only lunch, but perhaps dinner. So um, we'll do this sermon in two parts, 15 through 27 this week, and, uh, and the rest through 43 um, next week. Important to see how it's unified, and hopefully we can pull those threads together. But let's hear uh, Luke 18, verses 15 through 27 this morning. This is God's holy and inspired word. Let us give our attention to its reading. People were also bringing babies to Jesus to have him touch them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called, Jesus called the children to him and said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I tell you the truth, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, Then who then can be saved? Jesus replied, What is impossible with men is possible with God. The grass withers. And the flower fades. The word of our God endures forever. Amen. Babies and young children are cute, adorable, but they are not perfect. They are not sinless. In fact, they are not sinless at all. The most important uh, thinker, the early church, was famous for talking about the doctrine of of original sin. Augustine spoke about this at length in his book, Confessions. And uh, him and and many other theologians have noted, along with keen parents, have noted the inherent sinfulness and perhaps even the unfettered selfishness of our young children and even our young babies. They demand food from their mother. They are filled with rage and fury when they do not get their way. They have not yet learned the patterns of civil behavior. They have no desire or willingness to share what they have. This means that young children are are harmless not because they will to do no harm. If you think they, they would not ever do harm, pay close attention to the look they give you when you take something away from them. Uh, that they want to have. They're harmless because they are weak. They are harmless because they cannot do anything to you or to anyone else when they are angry. They, they are so weak that common sense demands that we do all that we can, we reorder our lives in radical ways in order to make sure that we do everything we can to protect them and to provide for them, even amidst, this may be strange to hear in regards to our adorable young children, but even amidst their selfishness and self-centeredness and corruption and viciousness. Augustine traces this dynamic from infancy to childhood to adolescence all the way to adulthood. The fallen nature of man 
He illustrates it for us in his own adolescence when he recounts a story, a story where he went to a neighboring vineyard in order to steal pears from a pear tree, not necessarily for any reason except that he wanted to sin. Listen to the words of Augustine. He says this, I stole that of which I had enough of my own and much better. In other words, he had, he had pears on his own. Nor when I had done it did I care even to enjoy the thing which I had stolen, but I joyed in the theft and sin itself. All this we did simply because we would go to where we should not. Behold my heart, O Lord, which you had pity on in the very bottom of the bottomless pit. I had no other provocation to ill but ill itself. It was foul, yet I loved it. I loved to undo myself. I loved my own fault. When we hear this story, we realize that Augustine is doing something quite remarkable in this book. He's, he's setting a theological trap for us because all of us here, as we hear those words or as we read those words, we hear, we remember the words of our own hearts and how our own hearts pull us into patterns of sin just because our sinful nature wants to do it and perhaps for no other reason than that. This story works on another level because Augustine is talking about taking forbidden fruit from a forbidden tree. So it resonates with the overarching story of humanity, that we are sinful uh, because of Adam's fall in the garden. Why does, he, why does Augustine write this way? Why does he recount his own life in this way? Because he sees in his own story the story of every man, particularly the stories of men and women who are saved by grace alone and transformed by grace alone. His story is a story of restless wandering because he sees that all human beings are hardwired to ask the right question. We ask, whom or what should I love? But in our sinfulness, we are doomed to give the wrong answer. We look at this world, we know that something must satisfy us. The only answer that we can give ultimately is ourselves because we elevate ourselves above God. We break his law in order to find that, that which will satisfy us and we show our inability. So Augustine is narrating the story of grace. And when we think about grace alone, the most important things we need to understand about it is that it is something that acts upon us from the outside. It comes as something external to us. And if we are to understand grace alone, uh, we need to see that grace is what overcomes our ability to answer that question correctly of whom or what should I love. Uh, Augustine actually penned that prayer that we use often in our worship services. You have made us for yourself, O Lord. And our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. This is Augustine narrating the story of grace. And the story of grace and grace alone is shown to us in this passage before us. So here's our life-transforming reality. In order to understand salvation by grace alone, we must see our coming to Jesus with empty hands And we must see the all-sufficient work of the Savior. We come to God with empty hands, and the work of Christ is all-sufficient to save us. And since those two things are true, that we come to God with empty hands, and because Christ's work is all-sufficient, we must see everything we have is at the disposal of Christ. We must distrust ourselves, and we must grow to love the Savior more and more. Because, the grace, because we are saved by grace alone, everything we have is at the disposal of Christ. We must distrust ourselves and we must love Jesus more and more. Three ideas that we'll use uh, to look at this passage together. First is how to enter the kingdom. Second is how not to enter the kingdom. Thirdly, the one in whom or by whom we enter the kingdom. First then, how to enter the kingdom. We remember that last week we looked at the the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Uh, These two men that were bringing prayers to God, the Pharisee is trusting in his own work. Uh, He's saying, I thank you, God, that you have made me this way because I'm not like the tax collector. I'm not like other people. He thinks that what he brings before God is is his own righteousness. The tax collector, as we, we thought about today, he doesn't just admit his sin. He confesses his sin. He doesn't, have, he doesn't become a defense attorney for his mistakes. He says, uh, God, I am unworthy to stand in your presence. Jesus says, this is the one who goes home justified. This is the one who goes home redeemed. And those, uh, that's what we learn about the grace of God. 
And then that's unpacked for us with the rest of chapter 18. Chapter 18 is really commentary on being saved by grace alone. The first part of this passage are these little children being brought to Jesus. Two things I'd like us to consider. The first is the lesson in Jesus' action. What Jesus actually does and what that teaches us. The second is the lesson in Luke's context. Why he puts this account exactly where he does. So first then, the lesson in Jesus' action. This is an important passage for us, especially as Reformed folk who disagree with our our Baptist brothers and sisters about the place of children in the covenant community of God. We see Jesus welcoming and, and receiving children as they are brought to him. We see that the, the disciples are getting upset about this. And, and they're saying, uh, no, no, this is not what Jesus should be doing. So they're rebuking the people that are bringing uh, these young children to our Lord. Uh, the reason for this, there, there's a cultural reason, is that important people would not have spent their time in public with little children. Little children had, socially speaking, lesser value. Even in the Greco-Roman world, that was true of women as well. Men were the ones who had high status. Men were the ones who had position. So Jesus, as this somewhat rising star, celebrity, some people think he may be the Messiah. The disciples are saying, Jesus is too important for this. Don't bring your little children to him. Even though, back then, children were cute and adorable as well. They're saying, don't waste Jesus' time. But notice what Jesus does. He calls out to them directly. He calls the children to himself and shows us how much uh, he values them. And so what we have confirmed here for us, even though this passage does not talk, uh, touch directly on the question of baptism in that there is no baptism in this passage, we learn, everyone learns, that young children are precious to God. They are precious to our Lord. And then as Reformed folks, what we learn is that through the family, our children are to be part of the people of God. As God has promised from the beginning, I will be a God to you and to your children. I found J.C. Ryle's words quite helpful on this, and so I'll quote him at length and listen to his words as he opens this up for us. He says, the souls of young children are evidently precious in God's sight." what we learn from Jesus. Both here and elsewhere, there is plain proof that Christ cares for them no less than for grown-up people. The souls of young children are capable of receiving grace. They are born in sin and without grace cannot be saved. There is nothing either in the Bible or experience to make us think that they cannot receive the Holy Spirit and be justified even from their earliest infancy. The baptism of young children seems agreeable to the general tenor of Scripture and the mind of Christ in the passage before us. If Jewish children were not too young to be circumcised in the Old Testament, it is exceedingly hard to understand why Christian children should be too young to be baptized under the gospel. Thousands of children, he says, no doubt, receive no benefit from baptism, but the duty of baptizing them remains the same. The minds of young children are not unequal to receiving religious impressions. The readiness with which their minds receive the doctrines of the gospel and their consciences respond to them is well known to all who have anything to do with teaching. Last but not least, the souls of children are capable of salvation, however young they may die. To suppose that Christ will admit them into his glorified church, that is heaven, and yet maintain that he would not have them in his professing church on earth, is an inconsistency which can never be explained. That's the lesson we learn from Jesus' action. That children, the souls of children, are precious to God, that he values them, that they are capable of receiving the grace of salvation, and that we have them in their, and their presence among us as the people of God. Secondly, the lesson in Luke's context. Why did Luke put this here, particularly right here in this part of his gospel. Notice, it's not just children that are being brought to Jesus. The Greek word here is brephos. It is infants. It's little, little babies, newborn infants that are being brought to Jesus. We've already said today a baby is not free from sin, but actually given to selfishness and self-centeredness. Thus, it's not baby virtues, a set of baby virtues that Jesus says, the kingdom of God belongs to such as these, right? It's not because of their chubby cheeks or 
anything else. There's something else uh, other than virtue that uh, has Jesus say this to us. It's, and that is this. It's that children, especially babies, newborn infants, they can do nothing of their own accord or of their own effort. Notice even in, in verse 15, these young children, these babies are being brought to Jesus, right? They, they can't get there on their own. They need to be brought to the Lord. And this is the picture of grace, that, it, that is true of everyone who enters the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is to receive salvation, kingdom of God, the realm of God's new creation and salvation. This is the picture of grace. We must be brought to the Lord. I sought the Lord, and afterward I knew. He moved my soul to seek him, seeking me. It was not I that found, O Savior, true, but I was found, was found of thee. Lord, tis not that I did choose you, that I know could never be, for this heart would still refuse you had your grace not chosen me. You remove the sin that stained me, cleansing me to be your own. For this purpose you ordained me, that I live for you alone. The lesson in the context of Luke is, is that entering the kingdom of God is not something that's attained by human effort or attained by standing via our accomplishments. And that brings us to the fact that it is purely of God's grace. Entering the kingdom of God is something that happens purely of God's grace, external to us. It's the unmerited favor of God. It's something we didn't deserve. It's the demerited favor of God. It's actually the very opposite of what we deserve. We deserve punishment and we get blessing. That's because God is a God of grace. One theologian says that grace is an application of God's character towards human rebellion. It's who he is. He is a God who is abounding in grace and mercy and steadfast love. He's slow to anger. And salvation is purely of God's grace. Our sinfulness is, it shows us that we are completely unable uh, to come to God with hands that are full. The, the Apostle Paul actually uses the imagery of death to describe our sinfulness and our sinful nature. We were dead in our transgressions and sins. This highlights another thing about the, the, the babies being brought to Jesus in this passage. The helplessness, the weakness of little children is meant to illustrate how incapable we are of bringing something to God that is worthy of his acceptance. It's like a telling a, a weak old infant, setting him or her down on the floor and saying, if you want your lunch, walk to the other side of the room. It's absurd. It's absurd, completely incapable of doing that. And that illustrates to us in our own life how our own heart, our own sinful heart is unable to produce righteousness and actually how our own sinful heart leads us down destructive paths into sin. Augustine once again illustrates this for us in his book Confessions. He talks about one of his friends, Olypius. Olypius was a man who was very sensitive to the grotesque violence in, in the gladiator games in that world. He was very careful to stay away from it, never wanted to take part in it. He had a lot of friends who would pressure him, said, oh, just come with us one time. Come with us one time to see the gladiator games. And uh, he gives in once. He, he goes with his friends, and, and he is there trying to uh, keep his eyes closed. But then in, in one moment, his willpower is overcome, he opens his eyes and he takes in this scene of really grotesque and pornographic violence. Augustine describes how in these few moments his friend becomes a different man. He drank deeply of this scene with sort of a, a bloodthirsty joy. He became a person that so craved this spectacle that he, he no longer waited for his friends to ask him to go, but he went on his own. He started finding others uh, to bring with him. And uh, so Augustine speaks with quite an insight. into This is before modern neurology knew that when we, we take in scenes of extreme violence or extreme sexual pornography, that the, the neural pathways of our brain are actually reconstructed so that we begin to crave those things. And somebody may look at that today and they will say, well, that, that, that's one of the, the, the ways in which science disproves God. But that's not it at all. It shows us that the fall of sin, our sinfulness, is not only spiritual, but it's physical and it's physiological. 
We have this sinful nature. It renders us hopeless. It, it brings us down paths of destruction. It renders us incapable of bringing anything before God. But grace overcomes that. Grace is external to us. Paul says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Ephesians 2 brings us then to verse 4. Ephesians 2, 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. M dash, by grace you have been saved. Paul says, that's grace. That's grace. You were dead. In your transgressions and sins, grace acts upon you externally, makes you alive, brings you to spiritual life, makes you alive. That's regeneration through the gospel of grace, the gospel of grace that God works through that message to bring your heart to life and to spiritual life. The kingdom of God belongs to those who are brought by the grace of God, like little children with empty hands, naked holding nothing of our own merit or achievement. And it's all, as Paul says, to the praise of his glorious grace. This is why if you understand grace, you understand why it disallows human boasting. If you, if you understand grace alone, you understand that there's, there's no way that anyone could ever boast of anything, of their own achievement before God. How to enter the kingdom, we must enter like a little child. How to not enter the kingdom. We see that in this interaction, the second interaction with uh, Jesus in this passage with this rich ruler. This rich ruler, we see his mentality that's really off track from the beginning. He says, what must I do to enter the kingdom of God? Well, what we've just learned, how does one enter the kingdom? How does one inherit eternal life? It's by, it's by the grace of God alone. We come as a little child with empty hands being brought to Jesus. And he says, what must I do? Well, what what does a young child do? What does a young baby do? Nothing. There's nothing that they can do in order to enter the kingdom. None of us have the goodness God requires. And that seems to be exactly why Jesus says what he does. Uh, The man says, good teacher, what must I do? Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Sort of a precursor to this whole interaction. As if this man is coming to Jesus saying, I'm going to call him good teacher. He's going to look at me, see that I'm good, declare me good, and tell me that I'm the kind of person that would enter the kingdom. Tell me that I'm the kind of person who would inherit eternal life. But note this conversation as it unfolds. What must I do? He says, Jesus says, what are the commandments? You must keep them. And this rich ruler says that he has done that. I've kept the commandments. In fact, I have kept all of them since I was a boy. There are people who overestimate their own obedience and who underestimate their own obedience. This is this guy is the former. He's overestimating overestimating his own obedience. Jesus does not get lured into that. Probably could have a long conversation about how he has actually broken the law in many places at many times in his life, but instead Jesus goes deeper. He wants to go deeper to the very heart of the matter, which is the heart of this rich man. He goes to his heart. He says, take all that you have, sell it, and give it to the poor. Jesus knows the idolatry of this man's heart. He knows what he treasures in his heart. This man loves his wealth. Not only does he love his wealth, he loves the fact that he is a wealthy man who still can say, I keep all the commandments of God. I've done all of these things. As a rich man, as someone with status, I have still been careful to keep the law of God. So ultimately we're learning what? He wants to enter the kingdom not as a baby, empty hands being brought to Jesus. He wants to enter the kingdom as a rich man with all that he has. That is precisely why he becomes sad when Jesus places this demand upon him. He wants to enter the kingdom as the rich man who has merited righteousness. So if he needs to give all of his riches away, that means he enters the kingdom as a poor man. He doesn't want to do that. That leads us to remember not only how this passage has has begun, Unless you become like a little child, like a little baby, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. It also shows us the enduring application of this passage for our own lives. Because if we understand that entrance is the kingdom into the kingdom is truly by God's grace and by God's grace alone, then anything that 
Jesus then gives to us any gifts that we have, any talents, any resources, at all is at the disposal of Christ. It, it transforms our mind to be able to see why we are to be freely such a giving people. My seminary professor uh, put it this way, seminary professor David Van Drunen, whose ancestors, by the way, he and I have found out his ancestors helped establish our church. They're pretty cool. This is what David Van Drunen says about this. If we enter the kingdom as a little child, then surely everything we have is at the disposal of the Lord Jesus. If we come as little children, we come with empty hands. We come with nothing. And if that's the case, anything that Jesus may give us, any talents, skills, time, or energy, any material resources, anything we have must surely be at the disposal of Christ. Not for us to keep for ourselves, to use as we will, but all that we have belongs to the Lord and needs to be put into his service. You see how grace alone produces this mindset in us, that God, by his grace, gives us that which will, will bring us rest, right? Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. And God says, in Christ, I, I give you that which you're, for which your heart so longs, for which your soul so longs. And anything that, that I give to you, I'm the Lord, I'm the Lord your God, anything that I give to you, that is to be at my disposal, it's to be given back. It's why we can say the heart that is transformed by grace can sing, take my life and let it be consecrated Lord to, to thee take my moments and my days my hands and my feet my voice and my lips my silver and my gold my intellect and my power my will my heart my love myself and I will be ever only all for thee this rich man thinks about it in reverse that's what makes Jesus say how difficult it will it will be for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, right? Speaking with hyperbole uh, to show that if you're trusting in your riches, if you're trusting in what you have merited, you're never going to enter the kingdom. And so the disciples of Jesus say, well, who can be saved? People who are rich, people who have accomplished much, these are the ones you would put in front of everyone if there's an important visitor to your village, right? You say, Here's our rich people. Here, here are the ones who have accomplished so much. Look at, look at all that they have done. They're saying, if the, if the rich and accomplished people, the people with status, aren't the ones who get into the kingdom, then who will? With man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And that brings us then, as we close, to our final idea, the one in whom we enter the kingdom. Look back at verse 22 just for a minute. There's something there uh, that, that we must see. Jesus tells this man, sell all that you have. Sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. Uh, this man is, is saddened by this first commandment of Jesus. He gets hung up on the, the sell all you have, but the, the real zinger is what comes just after that. He says, sell all you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. People get uh, worried about this passage, especially as Protestants, because uh, when this man comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus really answers with the law, <laughs> a command. This is something you must do. Sell all that you have and give it to the poor and then come and follow me. But what is Luke doing? in the context. What, what is the gospel of Luke showing to us at this point? See, Jesus knew the heart of this man. He knew the idolatry in his heart, and so by bringing him to something that he must do, what Jesus is doing is magnifying his own work. Because what has the gospel of Luke been telling us? It's been telling us that only Jesus will walk all the way to Jerusalem and go to the cross and finish the work that his father has, done, has set for him to do. If we think about the Christian life in terms of what should I do before we think about what has Jesus done, we will be crushed under the power of the law, under the crushing weight of the law. What Jesus is doing is reminding this rich ruler, he's reminding the people around him that he was the one who was rich, who became poor, who gave up the glory and the communion with his Father and the Spirit that he had enjoyed from all eternity. 
What he's doing is he's magnifying his own work. He who was rich became poor so that through his poverty we who are poor might become rich. Behold the riches of God's grace as enacted through the poverty of God the Son. He humbled himself. So as Jesus is unfolding all of these things about grace alone and the rest of this chapter all about the, the, the importance of grace alone and understanding grace alone, at the very middle of that chapter, he takes a pause. He says, the Son of Man is going to Jerusalem. Everything written about him will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. The third day he will rise again. The disciples cannot understand this. What does that mean? They can't understand what Jesus is saying. Because they have not yet learned that the Son of Man came not to be served. See, if, if there's anyone who should be served, it's the Son of Man. The Son of Man is the one in the book of Daniel who rules the nations. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So if you want to understand grace alone, if you want to understand grace alone, you need to understand both of these pictures. First is this, we come into the kingdom as a, as a baby, with empty hands, naked, holding nothing in and of ourselves and of our merit. And then secondly, we need to see the all-sufficient work of Christ by which we stand. Grace is never cheap. It happens because of what has happened in Christ. It's, grace is not God's capitulation to sin. It's, got, it's not God's ignoring sin. It's not cheap sentimentalism. Grace is God's love for us in Christ that is greater than all of our sin. So come to the Savior with empty hands. Understand that that is how we come to him. That is how we are saved by grace alone. He who worketh not but believeth in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. When you understand that your life in the kingdom of God, your life in salvation is purely by grace alone, think about how that transforms your mindset to be able to look at everything you have that you can use freely and give freely because it's at the disposal of your Lord and your King. God, by his grace, wraps us up in his arms like a mother to a newborn infant. We are brought to him, nothing of ourselves like a newborn baby in God's covenant people that are brought to the fountain of, fountain of grace in baptism. Life in the kingdom is about entering with empty hands. Life in the kingdom is about entering by God's grace alone. And thus we are able to give it all back to him. And we are to love him more and more as we see the truth of his grace in our own lives. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you, we pray that your word as it has been opened up this morning, that, that it will go into our hearts, that you will work uh, through your uh, imperfect servant. Father, forgive us of our sins and those things which displease you, Father. Uh, may we be uh, a, a redeemed people uh, who love you and who serve you. And may we understand, even just a little bit more, may we understand grace alone and being saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Thank you for the gospel, for your word, and for your church. It is in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let us go. To number 521. We'll just, we'll sing verses 1 and 4 of my hope is built on nothing less. Verses 1 and 4, the first and the last. Let's stand together, sing verses 1 and 4, 521 in our red hymnal.
Amen. Have a great day in Christ. Receive God's benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.